الحمد لله الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف المرسلين وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين. We're gonna go over today, inshallah, in very brief manner, the method of performing the Umrah in accordance to the Quran and the Sahih Ahadith, the Sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Uh, in this, inshallah, for those of you that are here, or if you have the ability, uh, Abu Ilyas, may Allah reward him, from our durus and umda and other places and other books, he's put together a very beneficial document. If you don't have it, ask him, he can email it to you. If you're on YouTube, you can put a comment and he can send it to you if your email is there. And you can follow along and also keep it as a guide, and it's a very beneficial guide. I uh, highly recommend everybody to get it. Jazakumullahu khairan. Tayyib. So we begin first and foremost, remembering that Umrah is an ibadah, it's something that is a worship, it's not a vacation, so you need to treat it as. And it has rules and regulations. It has rules and regulations. For it to be accepted, like for salah and zakah and things, you have to follow the rules and regulations. The first thing we'll discuss is what are the arkan of Umrah? Okay, what are the pillars? What is a must in the Umrah? So the first thing, and there are four that you will memorize, insha'Allah. The first thing, the ihram. Tayyib, and I want to make a point here. Many people that take groups for hajj and umrah and are not concerned about the shari'i ahkam of it, they ruin your hajj and umrah and you will be held accountable and they will be held accountable on the Day of Judgment. So we don't want to do that here. We want to do it in accordance to the correct way. The ihram has to be put on before the miqat, before you cross the miqat. For those living in Mecca, it's different. For those you know, that are in Hijaz, there's different things. But for us that are going to be coming, we're going to be crossing the Miqat. You have to have the Ihram on before you cross the Miqat. That means your niya, the rules of Ihram, what you can wear, all of that starts from for the Miqat. What we see a lot of people doing is they're in a plane, and if you land in Jeddah, you're going to cross the Miqat that you have, before you get to Mecca, you're going to get it before the airport. So what people do is they don't worry about it and then they freak out on the plane. And then they're getting naked and, and changing on the plane and then don't, don't do this. All right? What you need to do is your last station before you get on the plane for Jeddah. Like for example, if you're in Abu Dhabi or Dubai or, uh, or Turkey or wherever, at that place, make your ghusl, put on your clothing for ihram from there. So when you're crossing over the Miqat, before you land in Jeddah, you will already have everything ready. You will renew your niya from the Miqat, but you will have everything ready. Don't try to change on the plane, please. It's disgusting. Tayyip. Now, the next issue about Ahram. Some people think that the rules of Ahram start from Makkah. They do not. The rules of Ahram start from the Miqat. Tayyip. So when you get to the Miqat, Everything, like for the men, and we'll cover the rules for covering the head and all that, starts from there. Last time I went for Umrah, there were people that they wore the ihram, but they were wearing their uh, qulansuwa, or what we call kufi, all the way to Jeddah. And I was telling them after Miqat that you can't be covering your head, and they were like, we're not in Mecca yet. <laughs> so, you know, uh, also one of the time when I was coming from Medina, we crossed the Miqat, and there was his brother to the bus, they didn't change. And in Medina, when you're coming, the bus stops at the Miqat, and we went, took a shower, put on, they didn't change. When we entered Mecca, they started to put on their ahram on a bus. <laughs> you know? So we told them, no, now you have you know, fidya and all these issues to deal with, which we hope we don't have to deal with. So make sure, especially the brothers that are going with us in Abu Dhabi, when you're there, take your shower, there are showers at the airport, put on your ahram, make your niya, and be ready. So when you cross the Miqat, you only make your niya again there, you will not have to then freak out. Tayyab, the next rukan from the arkan of Umrah is the tawaf. Making tawaf around al-bayt. Around, and there is many sunan. I'm just going over the arkan right now. Tayyab, the tawaf is from the arkan of Umrah. The sa'i, going between Safa and Marwa, this is from the arkan. And then cutting or shortening your hair, it's from the arkan. These four things are the bare minimums of Umrah. I'm not saying that's all you do. But this is what you must, must, must do. These are arkan. If you violate these, it's a big problem. How to fix it is a long, detailed discussion. The niyyah should be made, and this is one of the times when Hajj and Umrah that you make your niyyah out loud. 
regularly, like for salah, you don't make niyyah out loud. The place of the niyyah is the heart. But this is one of the things where Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa he made the niyyah out loud. You can do it at your last rest stop and then renew it and say it again when you're crossing the miqat. As long as you make your niyyah before the miqat, you're good. Tayyib. Where are the different miqat? Inshallah, on a map we can go over it, but you don't really need to be concerned about it because for you, you're going to be going on a plane to Jeddah. If you're going to Jeddah, then before Jeddah you will cross the Miqat. And they'll make an announcement and you should know that you're crossing the Miqat. If you go to Medina, then on the way they tell you where the Miqat is, that's your Miqat. Now, what is the niyyah? You say, Labbaik Allahumma bil Umrah. If you're going for Hajj, and depending on Tamatu or not, you, can, you have Allahumma Labbaik bil Hajj. But here you're going for Umrah, then you say, Allahumma Labbaik. Performing ghusl when you're putting your ihram is mustahab. Making two raka'ah and things, these are things that are mustahab. And many of the ulama have discussed this. From the time when you make your niyyah, the rules of ihram, they get into place. And you should then, after crossing the miqat, start making the talbiyah. What is the talbiyah? Labbaik, Allahumma labbaik, labbaik, la sharika laka labbaik, inna alhamda wa ni'mata laka alhamd. Like our mulk, la sharika lak. These are the talbiyat. And there are other athkar with it that are mentioned. All of those you can make. The men should make the talbiyah out loud. The men, they should make it out loud. Not for 10 seconds, not for a few minutes, as much as you can. Okay, what we see all the time, when you get to the miqat, everybody, labbaik, Allahumma labbaik, labbaik, la sharika lak, labbaik. And in a few minutes, and then they go back to not doing it. No. The entire time until you get to Mecca, you should be making the talbiyah. Okay, as much as you can. If you get tired, you stop, it's okay, but try. The men should be doing it out loud, women should be doing it silently. You do not have to do it in unison. Please. You do not have to do it all together. Okay, yeah? This has become almost a bid'ah in our time where everybody has to do it together. Your talbiyah is yours. Now, if you're saying it and people are saying it at the same time, nothing wrong with that. But you don't have to do it at the same time, everybody makes their own. Tell you, women, you have to do it too, but silently. Men, you should do it out loud. Tell you, ihram. When you enter a state of ihram, you're gonna first perform ghusl. This is mustahab. The man uh, and the woman, even if she is haid or in taste of nifas, she performs the ghusl. We'll discuss about some exceptions later. Now, for the man. It's mustahab to put perfume and they can put it on the body. Uh, now, if you put atar or perfume on your ahram before you enter the state of ahram, this is jayas. Once you enter, then you will not be putting atar and things on anymore. For the men, you can have the scent, but you shouldn't color it. And for the woman, if they apply something with color, they can do it, but they shouldn't scent their ahram. Once in a state of ihram, you will not be putting on perfume. Men, women, no more atar once you're in a state of ihram. Tayyib, what about deodorants? What about any of these things? If it has a pleasing smell, you cannot use it. If it's just like talcum powder or something that stops the odor smell, and it doesn't have a smell of its own, there is jawaz on this. Tayyib, if you use, for example, they have, uh, you know, those little napkins that they give you at the plane when you're going and it has a smell and the smell stays on you, you cannot do it in ahram. Tell you, now there is soap, soap has its own smell, that's fine, but if it's scented, it's better you don't mess with scented soap, even though that gets washed off, but if it stays in your body, it can be a problem. Tell you, making two raka'ah after entering the state of ahram, as we mentioned, there are some dalail that point towards this and the ulema have mentioned this. Things that are forbidden in ahram. Those things that you cannot do in ihram. For the men, you will wear the idhar and the rada. In essence, there is not a hadith that clearly says this is all you can wear. But Rasulullah forbid the silwar and other types of clothing. And the ulama looking at everything that the Prophet forbid, they, they derived a very important usul that you don't wear stitched clothes for men. You will be wearing unstitched clothes. So even the izar will not be stitched up. It will be loose. And the rida that goes on top, so two pieces is for the men. No underwear, no boxers, 
no t-shirts, no wife beaters, none of those things. Tell you, what about a belt? Can you wear a belt? Yes. Why? Out of darura, out of necessity, you can wear a belt. Can you wear a watch? Yes. It's out of necessity, you need to know the time. Can you wear a, a, a pocket that hangs, that you keep your passport and money and things? Yes. Sheikh Salih Al-Fawzan and Sheikh Ibn Uthaymin, other ulema, they have said with Dalail that these things are permissible out of necessity. Tayyib, can you wear a baseball hat? No. For the man, you will only wear the izar, the rida, and you will have your head uncovered. Tayyib, no imama, no qulanswa, no shimag, none of that. You cannot take cloth and put it on your head, take your izar, like we see all the people in Ahram, they take the rida and put it on their head, no. Now, if there is extreme heat or some problem, and you take an umbrella, for example, nothing wrong with that. The umbrella, it shades you, but it doesn't touch your head. If it's extreme, extreme, you're going to pass out or something, those are uh, you know, unique situations, but don't misuse it. Tayyib? So the head should be uncovered for the man, not the woman. Not the woman. Okay, making this clear. For the man, your head should be uncovered in ihram. A man should not wear shoes that cover the ankles. Tayyib? High tops, those kinds of shoes you cannot wear. You wear shoes that are low. Your ankles should be exposed. Some of the ulama, they said that the top part of your foot has to be exposed. But it's a weak understanding of the words that are used in the hadith. What you have to do is your ankles have to be exposed. They should be like what we call slippers or those shoes that are low in profile that are slipped on. You don't wear khuf. If you have nothing else and you wear khuf, you have to cut them so they don't cover your ankles. So you can get some walking shoes. You know, slip-on shoes, they shouldn't be high tops, they shouldn't cover your ankles. This is the footwear for ihram. Tayyib, can you wear socks? No. If you wear low-cut socks, there is jawaz, but the best thing is you leave socks out of ihram. Unless there is a necessity. What if you have some kind of infection or some necessity? That's a different situation. We're going to discuss the general rulings. If you have some particular situation unique to you, you can discuss that with me later. Tayyib. What about the woman? The woman wears any halal, yani proper Islamic garment. It doesn't have to be white. It doesn't have to be two pieces. The woman, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made it easy for them. They don't have that same restriction. But it has to be proper Islamic hijab as she should wear anywhere. And you don't just wear hijab for ahram. <laughs> you know, you should wear the proper modest Islamic clothing everywhere. But especially if you're going... For Umrah and Hajj, you should be very careful to make sure that it is modest clothing. The woman, she cannot wear a fixed niqab. Any niqab is a piece of cloth that was known in the time of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi It would be not the khimar, which is on top. It would be a fixed piece of cloth. And Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi forbid this. Or gloves for the woman. She can wear socks, but gloves and niqab are not allowed for the woman. Does that mean she cannot cover her face? No. She can and should cover her face. As Sheikh Ibn Baz and Sheikh Ibn Uthaymeen and others have discussed, from the hadith of Aisha radiallahu anha, that she mentioned that when the non-mahram men would come close, we would cover our faces with our khimar. And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa was there. So obviously when he some, sees something, and iqrar al-Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he allows it, that means that this is sunnah. Tayyib. So for the woman, she doesn't wear a fixed niqab, but from what's actually called the khimar, nowadays people call it the hijab, from your cloth that's on your head, if you take a part of that and cover your face, this is what you should do. Okay? Because now, when you go, the non-mahram are going to be next to you. Now it's not like the old days where you'll be with your family, with your camels, making your own tawaf, no. Now you're going to be you know, a few inches away from non-mahram, so there is no way that they're not going to look at you, so you should cover the face. Can that covering touch your face? Of course it can. Some people do these strange things now they have a baseball cap. They get a brim and they put a cloth on it. And they say because the cloth can't touch your face. Do you think Aisha Radiana had a brim? She had a baseball cap? How are you going to make sujood? Where did you get this from? Who said it can't touch your face? Which hadith? Which ayah? No. Aisha Radiana says we took our khimar, covered our faces. So take your khimar, cover your face. There is no problem with it touching your face. There's no dalil for saying that it cannot touch your face. And in fact, the strange inventions that people have today, where they have these elaborate hats and then the cloth hanging, the Sahaba didn't have this. 
And then you see the worst. You see them there, either they can't move, make sujood because they have a brim sticking out. Or in salah, then they turn it to the side and expose the face anyway. So what was the point? So these things are not necessary. This is some weird you know, developments that somebody made somewhere. May Allah uh, you know, reward them for their niyyah, but this is not from the sunnah. Tayyib. For the woman, any color is permissible, but it shouldn't attract attention. You're not there to show off. You, know, you don't have to make a wedding dress type of a dress and put beads and all this. You're not there to attract attention. It should be simple. It should be with proper haya, yani your shyness. And you go in that sense. Um, now, when you are in a state of ihram, you cannot shave any hair or cut your nails. Yep. Cutting nails, uh, shaving, cutting, trimming your hair, you cannot do in a state of ihram. When you finish your umrah, you will do it. You will cut your hair. And we'll discuss that in a minute. Tell you, but can you comb your hair? Yes. You can comb your hair. But don't do it so harsh or in a way that it's going to start ripping your hair out where it could count as you're cutting your hair. Tell you, can you take a bath? Yes, you can. Can you wash your head while taking a bath? Yes, you can. And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa did, as Abu Ayyub al-Ansari radiallahu anhu reports a sahih hadith, that in ihram, Rasulullah washed his head, he took a bath in ihram. Some people say you can't wash your head because hair will break. No. You can take a bath, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa did it, you can wash your head, you can comb your hair, but just be careful not to break your head. If some hair breaks unintentionally, nothing wrong with that. But if you're taking a brush and you're rubbing hard and you're ripping hair out, then you shouldn't do that in ihram. Tell you. Um, obviously, jama'a bain azawjain is not allowed in ihram. I'm not going to need to go into detail with that, or other things that you know regularly may lead to something like that. Um, Tayyib, you cannot get married in ihram, right? If you if you do it before ihram or after ihram, there is jawaz. But inshallah, during ihram, you cannot do the nikah and things like this. You cannot hunt in ihram. I don't know what you would be hunting for in Mecca nowadays. But this is a ruling. You cannot hunt in ihram. You cannot kill things in ihram. Except for that which is dangerous, as mentioned in the hadith, for the scorpion and the snake, which the ulema, they take a general ruling. So, for example, when I was in Hajj in 2000, uh, there was a mosquito and I killed it. I was like, oh man, I killed the animal. So I went to the ulema. They said, because this is dangerous. It's something that spreads disease you know, malaria and all these things. If you did it, there's nothing wrong with this. So like that, if there is a, a spider that could bite you, or a scorpion, or a snake, or something harmful, you can kill it. But if you see ants, or you see bugs, don't kill them, you're an ahram. No cutting trees, no hunting. Now if somebody hunts, and they bring something, you can eat it, even if you're an ahram, as we mentioned from the Sahih Ahadith during the Sira Durus. Tayyib. When you enter Mecca, from the Sahih Hadith, it is mustahab to perform ghusl. Yani one ghusl when you put your ihram, but also when you're entering the city of Mecca, it's mustahab. Now it is difficult because, you know, you're going in a bus, there's no place when you're entering Mecca and things. If you can, alhamdulillah, it's good. If you cannot, you know, don't, don't stress yourself out about it. This is something that is mustahab. Now, to enter Mecca from the northern pass, uh, this is something that is uh, from the sunnah, but nowadays it's very difficult because you're going to be in a bus and you don't know which way they're going to be going. Now, when something is lost in Mecca, in a state of ihram, or otherwise, when, it's, when something is there lost in Mecca, you shouldn't pick it up and take it unless you're returning it to the owner. Like you see somebody drop their wallet, you can give it to them. Otherwise, in Mecca, you're not supposed to take things that are dropped and... Uh, you cannot harm the trees or bushes. So even if you find nowadays bushes and things, don't stomp on them and things. Even though nowadays hardly any bushes there, but these are things that are mentioned with the ahkam of Umrah. Tayyib, when you enter Majd al-Haram, and I'm summarizing here, when you enter Majd al-Haram, some people say you have to walk backwards and before you close your eyes until you see the Haram. All of this is bid'at. Look, yeah, <laughs> uh, you know, don't do these things. You're going to bump into people, you're going to harm people, don't do this. Okay? You enter the masjid from the sunnah to enter from Bab Bani Shaiba. Now, this is Mustahab, and that is the closest Bab to Hajr al Aswad, to the black stone. This is Mustahab, but any door you enter is fine. But this is something that's mentioned from the sunnah of Rasulullah. When you enter Masjid al Haram, like any other masjid, you enter with your right foot. 
you make the azkar, you send the darud ala nabi, and things like you do in any other masjid. So those ahkam are not just for umrah, they are for regular masajid. But what is different about masjid al-ihram, masjid al-haram, is that you do not make the two rakat tahat al-masjid when you enter. What we know from the sunnah, the tahiyat for masjid al-haram is the tawaf. So the first thing Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa did is when he entered, he would go straight and perform the tawaf. So if you go to the masjid al-haram, you don't need to make two rak'ah like a regular masjid. Instead, as ta'adheeman for that masjid particularly, you go make tawaf. And that's why there is no tawaf in any other masjid. All right? Just letting you know. No other masjid. This masjid al-haram particularly. You go straight to the black stone and uh, will begin the tawaf. You'll be facing the black stone itself. And there are some askar and things, inshallah, that are mentioned mawqufan that we'll go over. Many askar we'll go over when we are there. But for the sake of time, I'm not going to go over now. Uh, to face Hajar al-Aswad, to make takbir, also to add Bismillah with it. These are things that are mentioned in a hadith, and this is from the Sunnah. If you can, it's mustahab to go and kiss Hajar al-Aswad, or at least touch it when you go. It's very difficult nowadays. It's very difficult. Very important. Paying attention. Very important point. It is mustahab. It is preferred to kiss or touch or make sujood on Hajr al-Aswad. It takes away your sins. There are ahadith for it. It is fard on you not to harm your Muslim brothers and sisters. What's the greater, you know? To harm a Muslim is haram. Right? So if you're going to elbow people, push people, fight people, sisters, if it's, it's fard on you to take care of your haya, of your shyness, if you're going to mix yourself where men are rubbing on you because you're trying to get to Hajr Aswad, you're doing the wrong thing. Okay? What you can do, just make ishara. Just point towards it. If you have a stick, Rasulullah Sallam, even with a stick, he made ishara. It doesn't have to be like you're making salah. Just point towards Hajr Aswad, say Bismillah, Allahu Akbar, and you bring in your tawaf. Okay? If you are touching Hajr Aswad, you kiss your hand and touch Hajr Aswad, there is jawaz for this. But if you're not, don't kiss your hand. Everybody that goes there, no, you're not throwing kisses, it's not from the sunnah, don't do it. If you're going to touch Hajr Aswad, kiss it, make sujood on it, kiss your hand when you're to put on it, that's different. But if you are making tawaf from far, you're making ishara, don't kiss your hand, this is a bid'ah. Tayyab, you begin counterclockwise, from Hajri Aswad. Your tawaf begins and ends at Hajri Aswad. You begin, you will make seven circles, tawaf. Tayyip. Seven times you will go around the Kaaba, beginning and ending at Hajri Aswad. So when you first make your takbir, make your ishara at Hajri Aswad, which is something special, this is something that came from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It takes the sins, it became black from taking the sins of the people. This is something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ordained. Then you begin there. You go around the Kaaba. When you're going around, there are two other uh, corners that you will go around. There is also an area, the Hatim. And this is marked right now with like a half circle that keeps it. You cannot go through it. If you go through it, your tawaf is invalid. Because that is actually a part of the Kaaba as we discussed earlier in the other dar. So you go around that, you don't need to touch the wall, you don't need to touch any other of the corners, except when you get to the last corner, Rukan, before Hajri Aswad. It's called Rukan Yamani. It is from the Sunnah to touch it. It is not from the Sunnah to kiss it. It is not from the Sunnah to make Ishara towards it. Please, because I hate correcting people when I'm there. When you're there, when you get to Rukan Yamani, don't make ishara, don't kiss it. If you can touch it, touch it. It is from the sunnah to touch it. Tayyip, now, while making tawaf, you cannot talk about useless things, you cannot talk about dunya, you cannot, because this is an ibadah, this is a salah. Rasulullah sallallahu called the tawaf a salah. So you have to be focused, you can't be FaceTiming and Snapchatting and caring. No, you, this is like as if you were in Salah. 
Now, and that's why from the correct opinion of the ulema, you need wudu to perform tawaf. Wudu is necessary for tawaf. Tayyib, what askar do you make in tawaf? There are other than between Rukn Yamani and Hajr Aswad, Rabbana atana fid dunya hasana wa fil akhirati hasana wa qina adhab al nar. This is the dhikr that is mentioned in Sahih Hadith between Rukn Yamani and Hajr Aswad. Tayyib, those of us going, inshallah, I will explain this there. If you are on YouTube or whatever or Facebook, you can look at the kutub or the Sahih Ahadith and Dua and look at the Sahih Ahadith, then you can find this Dua. You should make this Dua. The rest of Tawaf, we don't find khas ahadith for their particular dua just make dua make dua from your heart make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make azkar don't get into this where one person is yelling and you're yelling behind them and you have no idea what dua they are making but you're all yelling together don't do this keep, keep some dua with you any azkar any dua you want make him or make your own dua what is from the sunnah follow that but otherwise we see these groups and one person is yelling and 50 people are yelling and nobody even knows the meaning and they make okay here you have to say this here you have to say this unless there is dalil you cannot make up your own bid'at tayyib when you get to the uh, hajr aswad again you have completed one again you make ishara if you can touch it if you can kiss it if you can make sujood on it you do if not which you probably won't be able to you make ishara you say the takbir and you continue your second and your third like that for the men for the men only in the first three you will jog and this is not just like a jogging but it should be in and what was known in the time of rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam as the way of the wrestler you walk with strength and vigor and for all seven you will expose your right shoulder Tayyip. Jogging is only in the first three And it's only for men But exposing the right shoulder Is in all seven Of the tawaf you're making for umrah And it is again only for men Sisters don't expose your shoulder please And sisters don't jog Okay If the brothers are there with their families And you cannot leave them by walking faster You can jog in place kind of a thing while moving But this is from the sunnah for the first three, you will jog in a vigorous, strong manner to show the strength of the Muslim Ummah. And for the brothers, you will expose your shoulder. You will go around from once around to the Hajr twice, three, four, five, six, seven. The seventh time when you get, you don't have to make Ishara now, you're done, and you will exit. You will exit without harming people, without getting into fights and all these kind of things, you have to plan it out. Don't freak out in the end. Tayyip? Now, brothers, please pay attention. Please. When you're done with tawaf, cover your shoulder. Don't leave your shoulder exposed. Okay? Because after tawaf, and you can drink zamzam, and, and this is something beneficial when you're in umrah, you will make two rak'at behind maqam Ibrahim. What does it mean behind? You don't have to be right behind it. Yani, the maqam should be between you and the Kaaba. Even if you're at the end of the masjid. But if between you and the Kaaba is the maqam, you are behind maqam Ibrahim. Don't start praying where people are making tawaf and now people are running into you. No, don't do that. Maqam Ibrahim, the place where Ibrahim والسلام, stood, and we know this place to be from Mutawatir Amali and from the books of uh, Imma and Ulema, where his footprints are. It is not from the sunnah to kiss it or to touch it. If you want to look at it, look at it, keep moving. Don't make special salawat, you know, try to get there all day, no. But after tawaf, you will make two rak'at, as Umar radiyan has suggested and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ordained, behind, yani where the maqam is between you and the Kaaba, even if you can't see it. Even if you're so far back, you can't see it. Tayyip, you will make the two rak'at. If you have your shoulder exposed, in these two rak'ah, this is makru. Covering the shoulders is something that you have to do in salah for men. For women, you should always have your shoulders exposed, covered. But if you make your salah with your shoulders exposed, this is makru in salah, so please make sure you've covered them. After that, again, drink zamzam, as from the sunnah. Zamzam is something that's blessed. It, the du'as are accepted. The way you drink zamzam is not like regular water. The way you drink zamzam, 
you stand and you look at the Kaaba. If you're drinking Zamzam at home, face the Qibla. If you're drinking Zamzam there, don't sit. Regularly, it's mustahab to sit and drink water. For Zamzam, it's mustahab to stand. You will stand, you will look at the Kaaba, and whatever dua you make will be accepted. Now, the method of acceptance, we know there is three types and all that, but it is definitely accepted. And the Zamzam is for whatever you drink it for. Whatever you drink it for, this is what it's for. So if you make dua for Iman and Quran and Hifz and all of those things, this is what you will get. So make sure you drink a lot of Zamzam and you make a lot of dua. This is from the things that is from the blessings of the Kaaba. Tayyib. Then you will go for Sa'i. You will begin at as Safa. And there are Adhkar and Dua that are from the Sunnah. We'll go over them when we're there. They're in the lesson as well. And you can get the books like Hassan al-Muslim, which mention the Sahih ones from the, uh, from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And you can make those. Tayyib. Um, when you begin, Nabda uh, bima bada Allah bihi. Yani this is something that you mentioned from when you begin on Safa, because Allah SWT Quran mentioned Safa first. Safa and Marwa. You will make seven, but not seven circles okay, between them. But you will start on Safa, and you will go to Marwa. When you get to Marwa, that's one. All right? Not all the way back to Safa. Not like the Kaaba where you're starting from Hijr, you're entering at the Hijr. Here, from Safa to Marwa is one. So Marwa to Safa is two. On Safa you make Dua, on Marwa you make Dua. In the middle, there used to be a, a bed, which was a dried river bed. And here Rasulullah again used to jog. Nowadays, they have the green lights to let you know where it used to be. Today, it's obviously all covered up. So here, for the men, it is from the sunnah to jog. For the women, it is not. And there are azkar and dua we can go over to make there as well that are from the sunnah. When you get to marwa, that's one. When you get back to safa, this is two now. You go back to Marwa, three. Back to Safa, four. Back to Marwa, five. Back to Safa, six. You will end at where? Marwa. You start on Safa, you end on Marwa. That is seven. So it's not circular. One is one. Back is two then. You will end on Marwa. After that, the only thing you have left to do is to trim the hair. I'm going to say this very clearly. And I want to make this very important note. Sisters. Do not take your hair out in the Kaaba and start cutting it. Please. All right? Or in Masjid al-Haram. We see many sisters there that start taking hair out. It's haram for you to expose your hair. Wait. Wait till you get back to your hotel. Wait till you get out. Wait till you get somewhere where it's private. And then cut it. And don't make a mess. When you go there, you see all this hair on the floor. People are slipping and you're harming Muslims. Don't do it. Why are you such a rush? Calm down. Go back. For the men, it is, from the sunnah, the best thing to shave the head. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa made dua for the one who shaves the head. Sahaba said, what about the one who shortens it? Rasulullah again, didn't reply that, made dua for the one who shaves the head. They asked again, the third time he made dua for the one who shaves the head. On the fourth time he said also for the one who shortens. So for the men, the best thing, you shave the head. Tayyip. This is the, one of the only times the Sahaba used to actually shave their head is Hajj and Umrah and things. If they shorten it, this is permissible, but the best thing to shave it. Tayyip. For the women, you cannot shave your head. For the woman, you will cut your hair the size of one fin- finger lock. So, you, For example, you put your hair around your finger and you cut it that much from the different sides. And this is enough for the women. Do not do this in Masjid Haram in front of people. Go when you do it. For the men, if you come out, there are many barber shops that will do it for you. If you want to do it yourself at your hotel, that's fine. But, you know, this is something. Once you shave the hair for the men or trim for the women, your ihram is done. Your umrah is complete. You don't have to go to Muzdalifa. You don't have to go to Jamarat. You don't have to go to Medina. This is your umrah. I suggest you go to Medina because it's one of the three masajid, Masjid al-Nabwi, that you should travel for. But it's not a part of the umrah. Tayyip, this is your Umrah. Inshallah, I'll stop here. Uh, if you have questions, I will answer them now. Inshallah. Otherwise, uh, refer back to the document. It's something very beneficial. Jazakumullah khair.